Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Gear, and it is my great, great pleasure to introduce, uh, to welcome all of you this morning and begin this exciting event. I'd like to start by thanking our student pianist, In A Ha, a master's candidate in piano, uh, for her performance this morning. Um, thank you, In A. I'd also like to thank and recognize all of the student presenters you saw on your way into the auditorium today. These students have all proposed projects that would further the work of today's symposium topics. They are all in consideration for funding by the President's Office to carry out this work, and we are all inspired by their dedication to these critical issues. Good luck to all of the students. Today, we welcome, honor, and celebrate Dr. Santa Ono's inauguration as the 15th president of the University of Michigan. I want to warmly welcome Santa Ono, our president and a member of our faculty in the College of Literature, Science and the Arts. The university's Board of Regents did wonderful work in selecting Dr. Ono, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Regent Jordan Acker. Welcome, Jordan. Good morning, and thank you, Dean Gear. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome our esteemed guests, including current and former U of M leaders, representatives from the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan student government, and members of the Presidential Search Committee. I would also like to recognize my colleagues on the Board of Regents who are here this morning. Uh, do I see Regent Kathy White from Ann Arbor? And is Kathy the only one who is the early bird this morning? <laughs> this is like lunchtime for Kathy, exactly. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to welcome you to the first symposium. We hope that you enjoy, enjoy it, the university and its community, past, present, and future. This symposium and all the activities you will see today reflect the greatness of our institution, its people, and its values. It's a big reason why the board, along with the search committee, selected Dr. Santa Ono as the 15th president of the University of Michigan. His dedication to the academy, his unceasing ability to connect with members of our community, and his passion and love for the University of Michigan. One of the ways that the University of Michigan sh uh, love shows itself is among the over 600,000 alumni, and of course, many of those alumni are members of the Alumni Association. If there's one thing that I can be sure of, it's that Dr. Ono will probably take selfies with every member of the Alumni Association before his retirement. That's a challenge, Dr. Ono. <laughs> and with that, I'm now honored to introduce the president of the Alumni Association, Corey Paulding. Good morning, and thank you for the introduction. I am delighted to represent and uh, bring greetings on behalf of U of M's global community of actually 658,900 alumni. Uh, we are truly leaders and best, and in my four months leading the AAUM following Steve Grafton's 28-year legacy, I've been both honored and awed by the innovators, the educators, the influencers, the change makers, nationally and internationally, nationally that comprise our dynamic U of M family. It's our goal to inspire alum to come home and to share their journeys and their Michigan moments propelled by their world-class education with us. We want everyone to join in. Among our esteemed alum is our keynote speaker and native Detroiter, Frank H. Wu. Dr. Wu was named president of Queens College, the City University of New York, effective July 2020, just shy of three years. President Wu previously served as chancellor and dean 
and then William L. Prosser, Distinguished Professor of Law at Hastings, at the University of California, Hastings. Before joining UC Hastings, he was a member of the faculty at Howard University, one of the nation's leading HBCUs, for a decade. He served as dean of Wayne State University Law School, and he's taught at our beloved University of Michigan, Columbia University, Stanford University, the Peking University School of Transnational Law, and Johns Hopkins University. He was for a decade a trustee and vice chair of Gallaudet University, the only university in the world dedicated to deaf and hard of hearing persons. In his many leadership roles, he was the first Asian American to serve in such capacities. Before his academic career as a graduate of Johns Hopkins and Michigan Law with Honors, President Wu held a federal court clerkship in Cleveland and practiced with the law firm of Morrison Forrester, where he dedicated a lot of his time to pro bono work. President Wu was appointed by the U.S. Department of Education to its National Advisory on Institutional Quality and Integrity and by the U.S. Defense Department to the Military Leadership Diversity Commission. He also served on the board of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund. President Wu is an author. He is the author of Yellow, Race in America Beyond Black and White, and he's the co-author of Race, Rights, and Reparation, Law and the Japanese American Internment, which received the single greatest grant from the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund. President Wu is a Huffington Post blogger, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the National Law Journal, and I could go on. He won the John Hope Franklin Award and the Chancellor Cheng Ling Tian Award, among other honors. And as a major media influencer, his most recent enlightening piece, published in the New York Daily News on being American and being Chinese, was just published last month. He is the American-born son of Chinese immigrants, married to Carol L. Azumi, an internationally known dispute resolution teacher and scholar. And dear to my heart, he is an avid runner, having finished more than 100 half marathons. He's also a theater goer, having completed the Shakespearean canon. Welcome home, President Wu. Good morning, friends. I'm humbled and honored to return home to Ann Arbor. As a kid who grew up just past North Campus, I would never have imagined someone such as Santa Ono being chosen to oversee one of the greatest institutions of higher education in the world. I congratulate you and the university on your appointment. Everyone is so excited to see what you will do. Back in the day when Canton was mostly cornfields, my parents, like so many who were drawn to this bountiful land of opportunity, believed fervently in the American dream. President Ono, I know, is someone like that too. And higher education is the engine of the American dream. It is how people gain entry into a world that was closed off to their parents and unknown to their grandparents. President Ono is exactly who is needed in this time and this place because he is a visionary capable of uniting people through science as well as sports. He displays calm, competence, and com compassion. These traits make you, in the language of today, relatable, and that's such an advantage as you serve this community, diverse as it is. President Ono has already established himself as someone you see around town in this, the quintessential college town. And he may be expert in his field, working on the eye, but he is nonetheless approachable and friendly. For some, of course, he isn't quite who you might have expected. And that's part of the theme today. All of us have stereotypes rattling around in the backs of our heads even if we're not quite conscious of how they influence our decisions and actions. President Ono already has a remarkable record of accomplishment for his research. We look up to you, I know that I do. When the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor penned the opinion in the historic cases involving University of Michigan and diversity in higher education, she wrote that the path to leadership must be open 
visibly open to people of all backgrounds. She could have been predicting this very moment. Until recently, people who look like the new president might not have been welcomed in leadership roles. Sure, they might be assumed to be oriented toward academia, bookish, smart. They could have gained entry as students or as graduate students. Maybe they would have been hired as researchers in labs. Yet, they might not have been deemed qualified to be in charge. Would they fit in at the country club or in the locker room? People talk about these high stakes decisions, about hiring with simple slogans about the best and the brightest. Yet in a well-run search, there will be multiple candidates who could meet that test. The choice then is which direction do you want to head in? People from these parts, of course, grow up whistling the fight song, Hail to the Victors. When we're traveling elsewhere and see someone with that baseball cap bearing the familiar Block M logo, we shout, Go Blue. And those who are privileged to attend this storied institution are transformed. That is what higher education does. It is its purpose. It changes people forever, introducing them to knowledge and as importantly to individuals whom they would not have encountered but for matriculating in Ann Arbor. Whether it's the baby boomers depicted in the big chill movie or Generation Alpha, you show up from the UP or New York City, you meet peers who are not like those from your own hometown. And students gain then more than the skills that they need. They are socialized into a world of diverse peoples. A generation ago, the University of Michigan, especially its students, fought for that diversity and its value. The institution, this institution, was willing to take a risk. Not all would have done so. Others might have shied away from that challenge of appearing in the United States Supreme Court. But the faculty, they offered evidence. They showed that what happens in classrooms which enroll people of different ethnicities and faiths, treating them as equals, respecting them, what happens in those classrooms is different than, it's better than what occurs in situations where everyone claims the same identity. Research supports this. It's neither speculation nor ideology. Teams in the corporate environment with diverse members imbued with a shared purpose perform better than groups with people who are all the same. So much of what is said nowadays about diversity and every issue is, is false. It's opinions based on assumptions that in turn are based on, on fiction. The claims of racial justice, however, are founded on facts. In the Michigan case, the students intervened in the litigation. They understood that they, above all, had a stake in the outcome. And they also had a perspective. They could personify these arguments. Uh, corporate CEOs and military commanders later filed crucial friend of court briefs, of course. But at the trial court, that's where the action was, and I was called upon to testify. I'd worked to bring Asian Americans into the picture, including with Wendy Yip, the first lady here at University of Michigan. Asian Americans had always been present, even before the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869 at Promontory Point, Utah. But Asian Americans often were not welcomed. They were absent from the Golden Spike ceremony and the photos on that uh, momentous occasion, and then they were excluded from the nation despite their contributions. My hope then, as now, was that Asian Americans would be seen not as the so-called model minority, nor relegated to the role of perpetual foreigners, but recognized as people of color in solidarity with others who have minority status. America invites us to invent or reinvent ourselves, and we do so in coalition and community with others who were once strangers to these shores. Since then, I've continued to be invited to debate affirmative action. As a supporter of diversity, I try to decline, and I'd like to explain why. I wonder if we might do what law professors do in the first year classes, which I took not far from here, as 
professors train people in how to argue, how to frame the question or how to reframe the question. The reason is the party who is able to determine what is asked has already won because they've implied, they've pointed at the answer already. And to debate affirmative action is to make a mistake. I say that as a supporter. Here's why. Debates are about winning and losing. They're about anger. They make you angry. They get people riled up. You cheer for your side, and the audience wants their champion to prevail. Whoever has the greater skills uh, as a speaker is the one who is triumphant, regardless of the substance of what they have to say. We would be disappointed, all of us, if one contestant said to the other, you know, you have a point. Maybe we should sit down and, and talk this through until we agree on a plan and take action. Even worse, though, to, to start with affirmative action is to begin at the end. These programs that go by that name are means to an end. They are a remedy. They're, they're meant to address an underlying problem. And any debater with even modest skill can distract people because every program, however much it is needed, still has some problems. I propose instead that we engage in dialogue, dialogue about racial discrimination, racial disparities. Undoubtedly, that will make people uncomfortable, even in a classroom, even on a campus such as this. But it can be done, and it must be done. It need not be each side shouting down the other while invoking free speech with selective sympathies, elevating hate over everything else. We need to take up the real issues that some are reluctant to raise, racism in all of its forms. That includes the egregious and the extreme on display once again, unashamed, violent, vengeful. There are incidents which are in your face, in our faces collectively. Hate crimes resulting in death, the cheering on of such acts, the refusal to hire or promote people of color or women and women of color, or to sell them a house or rent an apartment, even to this day. It extends to what is structural, what is subtle, the burdens of history that we all bear, the implicit bias, what may be ambiguous, the slurs uttered before attacks. You cannot be sure that you're safe from escalation of prejudice, even if you're walking down the street minding your own business. In the past few years, we have all borne witness. All of us are affected by the horrific crimes documented in these viral videos. The brutality compels us to avert our gaze, even as it also causes us to, to be obsessed, to look upon what people can do to others with malice of forethought. Some, though, are much more directly the victims because they were all along the targets. Their communities are terrorized and traumatized, and this is tangible. The killings of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, most recently of Tyree Nichols, have in common what, what must be named anti-black racism. During the pandemic, Asian Americans were assailed as they went about their business, blamed for a disease as if they themselves were the virus, regardless of their ethnicity or their citizenship, even if they were healthcare workers, risking their own lives at the front line. Anti-Semitism, which has persisted for millennia, has again become an open menace, squarely at the forefront, not hidden in the background. These incidents are not random. They form a pattern. Yet there are those who malign the victims for being victims, as if they had wished for that status. They mock those who mourn while congratulating themselves for their own hostility and indifference. By doing that, they betray their animosity. It is the last stand, in some sense, of white supremacy. 
The fear that was once relegated to the fringes has become fashionable in the mainstream under the name of the great replacement theory. If you don't know what that is, I suggest you Google it and take a look at where it's showing up. There is so much proof then of the existence of bigotry, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. They enjoy a home on social media, resurgent in animosity and resplendent in, in depravity. Alongside the substantiation of this hate, however, is the defense of it. It defies belief that there, there's so much denial. On college campuses, we might take for granted that people are aware of what is acute, but around us are many who would dismiss facts as woke or cancel culture to avoid acknowledging these realities. They have their own dog whistle slogans, emojis, and memes. So instead of debating affirmative action, allow us to discuss racial discrimination and racial disparities which endure. What scholars study here on this campus ultimately ought to generate consensus and then action policies that we can implement, because these are not problems of the past, nor of the far reaches of the world. The issues bear down upon us right here. Extremists in this very state recently plotted the kidnapping and murder of government officials whom they despise for those officials' embrace of the full range of humanity. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr offers an example of principle and of strategy. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, as worth reading today as when he penned it two generations ago, he demonstrated the enduring power of American ideals. Imprisoned for civil disobedience, he had been fighting racial segregation, overt racial segregation. He reached out, he faced down, white clergy, fellow members of the cloth in the Deep South who criticized him, claiming that they too were preaching reconciliation. Dr. King did not call them out for hypocrisy and bad faith. He accepted their claims, however dubious. He inquired respectfully and effectively, politely but provocatively. He asked them what they were prepared to do. Since they had declared a commitment to the same values, Dr. King insisted, they were expected, rightly then, to live up to their own rhetoric. He did not need to shame them in their congregation to know that he had issued a call which demanded a response. That was his genius. Today, we are in the same situation. Every corporate leader, every elected official, every university president, well, almost all of them, proclaims that they care about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. And young people, our own students, will not hesitate to dismiss what, what is merely performative, what is just pretend. The imperative is to pursue justice. And we all know, as we are gathered here, that we may need very soon alternatives to what we have been doing. It will be easy enough, soon enough, to see who is genuine in pursuing that goal and who is just pretending. In that regard, I would be remiss if I failed to mention Detroit, less than an hour's drive away. My hometown has been riven by race. The Motor City was made and unmade by the automobile. A century ago, Henry Ford, not someone whose opinions we should praise, he offered up $5 per day to any man who would toil on the assembly line he didn't invent it, but he perfected it. And this was Silicon Valley when Silicon Valley was still growing oranges, with more engineering talent amassed by the big four automakers than could be found in any other place on the face of the globe. The blue-collar middle class flourished thanks to what was called the Treaty of Detroit. A member of the United Auto Workers could afford the car they built, even to retire to a cottage up north on a pension with health care. But suburban sprawl soon crossed Eight Mile Road, and that network of interstate highways enabled families to empty out neighborhoods, even as the routes, as those highways divided some neighborhoods, Black Bottom and Chinatown. White flight began well before the long, hot summer of 1967. Some of you may recall that year. I was born that year. There is hope again, though, 
with the artisans and the farmers, even the rebuilding of the magnificent train station downtown. And the University of Michigan has so much it could contribute. It can once again be found in the city, right on Woodward Avenue, the thoroughfare which runs from the central core to what was formerly the countryside. As he settles in, President Ono has shown characteristic modesty. He has the needed qualities of servant leadership. And as confident as he is and must be, he also knows how to bring together the many stakeholders who depend on him. He will soon confront a dilemma. The Supreme Court has once again taken up diversity, and they have signaled already a lack of affinity. They make, may make it more difficult to do what is needed, but it would be impossible not to pursue what is right and just. And the University of Michigan is deservedly renowned. In a moment of disease and famine and war exacerbated by doubt and division, universities are called upon as civic institutions. They have a foundation dedicated to research and creativity, teaching and learning. They offer to the world ideas and the implementation of ideals, even as the very concept of a social contract is tested. For a university, a public one such as this, bearing the name of its home, the abiding arrangement is material support from the taxpayers in exchange for material contributions to the common good. And COVID-19 laid bare our attitudes about that common good. For most of us, we see that our actions have consequences which apply to others, what economists call externalities. For some, the hoed is every person for themselves. Yet we are able, with the pandemic over, to gather once again, and that is why people now come to celebrate. This occasion is for the many, not for the few. There are those who will never stroll across the diag who will benefit from what happens at the University of Michigan, whether it's the professor's search for a cure for cancer or an alumna's entrepreneurial spirit establishing a new business. In conclusion, perhaps diversity is like democracy, a process rather than an outcome. These ideals are are paired, they're twins to one another. Allow me to offer a law professor stock and trade an analogy. Democracy is not a product. You cannot buy it. It's not a project you can finish. When you are in line at, at your polling place in your neighborhood to cast your ballot, exercising a right, fulfilling responsibility, if the person in front of you were to turn around and say, why are we doing this again? We just did this two years ago you would know they missed an important civics class in high school. It matters not who you vote for. The act of expressing yourself, identifying your representative, that's what counts. It's the participation, the engagement in civil society which is vital. You roll up your sleeves, you take part, you follow the news, you know what's happening, you support a candidate and a cause, and even if you never uh, once run for office yourself, you are integral to democracy. It would be a tragedy if it were done. Democracy is what beckons with hope the world over. Diversity, I submit, is the same, a process, not an outcome, with the same need for our role, our participation, our engagement as individuals and as communities. We must stand up and speak out. I know that President Ono will do that thoughtfully and persuasively. Thank you so very much. Thank you. What a bold call to action. As we now turn to evaluating our past, and President, you can join us here, and examining our present, and necessarily looking forward what is the landscape that is emerging to greet the University of Michigan? Let's think about the U of M student of the future, the alum of the future, as we have this conversation. Our goal here is to talk about, and with the esteemed professors for this discourse, excuse me, what are the structures to be studied, what are the structures to be adapted, what are the structures to be challenged? Indeed, what are the structures to be launched? For this discourse, esteemed faculty joining us, 
are Dr. Elizabeth Cole, University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor, Women's Studies, Psycholo Psychology, and Afro-American and African Studies, College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. We'll also be joined by doc Dr. Stephanie Freiberg, University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor of Psychology, College of LSNA also, and Dr. Morella Hernandez, Ligia Ramirez de Reynolds, Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, Ger Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. You'll be both enlightened and inspired by their leadership in helping us understand and shape U the University of Michigan for the promise and challenges ahead. Let's welcome them. So glad to be here. So as we get ready to do this assessment of our past, looking backward, evaluating where we are today to help us plan for the future, I want to lay a bit of a framework for where we are. Let's really start to think about what is going to greet the University of Michigan in the years and, and days ahead. Who is the student of the future? Indeed, who is the alum of the future? The backdrop generationally for this conversation starts with understanding that societally today we have five generations that have been recognized. We have our traditionalists born in 1928, starting in 1928. We have our baby boomers uh, born starting in 1946. Uh, we have Gen X born starting in 1964, 1965. We have millennials, yes, millennials, start, born starting in 1981 and Gen Z, born around 1997 and onward. The question is, what is next? What is next on the horizon? As President Wu shared, the answer is Generation Alpha, also known as the I generation, the glass generation, Generation C. Glass and I, based on the level of technology that is part and parcel of their worlds, Generation C as a reference to COVID. Three things to know about this generation. Born between 2010 and 2024, already two and a half million born each week, primarily in the areas of India, China, and Indonesia. By 2024, two billion Gen Alpha will be on the globe. Number two, what do we know about Gen Alpha? Gen Alpha, of course, are tech savvy. I saw a gizmo worn by a second grader just this weekend. They are used to a world of extremes, whether we're talking about weather, whether we're talking about the unfortunate prevalence of school shootings. They are used to education without books. They learn from screens. And lastly, they are completely dedicated to saving the planet. The third thing that we need to know about Gen Alpha as we begin this conversation is they will be at the University of Michigan's doors in 2028, in other words, five years from now. So as we begin this conversation, we want to help ourselves understand the path forward by starting and looking back. Dr. Elizabeth Cole is here as the lead on the Inclusive History Project that's been launched at the University of Michigan, who will share a bit about how we're evaluating our history, even as we look forward. So Dr. Cole, share a bit about what's going on in your space that will inform this path forward. Well, thank you, Corey. Um, as she mentioned, I direct the National Center for uh, Institutional Diversity, and we were founded in 2005 in direct response to U of M's involvement in the Supreme Court cases that President Wu talked about. Um, NCID was created as a way to coordinate, advance, local and national efforts to diversify higher education in society. And that's a mission that we continue today. So in a really tangible way, our work is an example of how historical events continue to shape the present. Um, as a University of Michigan alum, I'm very proud of this history. Um, but at the same time, I've taught here since 2000. And as an African-American woman, I'm also very aware of the ways that we've sometimes fallen short 
of uh, those ideals. And when I'm talking about this, I often tell an anecdote about um, many years ago, I was attending the Black Celebratory, which is an annual graduation event we have to recognize our black graduates. And two young women sang Hail to the Victor a cappella, and they sang it in a minor key. And I felt like everyone in Hill Auditorium that day could hear musically what they were communicating, their, their profound sense of pride and identity at being Wolverines, at the same time that there was this sense of pain and sorrow, and that those two experiences were twinned up, and that that's often true of um, African-American students here. Um, I think it was a really clear and vivid moment um, demonstrating that, and um, it really drove home to me the importance of recognizing these stories as part of our collective history, um, and to think about the ways that that history affects all of us here. And so that's why I'm really thrilled to be um, co-chairing the Framing and Design Committee of our um, Inclusive History Project. This is a five-year project um, that we are very um, happy to be supported in by President Ono. And what we're trying to do is deepen our shared understanding of the university's past by studying and documenting this history um, through the lens of DEI. And this year, we're planning for that work to come. So we have two main goals. Um, we want to produce and widely share this new inclusive history of U of M. And we want to reckon with that history and um, lead the campus in a discussion of what it demands of us in the present and for the future. Um, this is very much a community effort. It draws on uh, existing history projects that have been underway here, uh, hoping to bring them together under one umbrella. And um, ultimately, we hope that this work and this conversation that it will spark will help us create an inclusive environment where every student can feel a sense of belonging. And what we're really trying to do, I think, is um, deepen and enliven this collective identity of what it means to be the leaders and the best. Um, so I'm excited to be with this panel and talk more about this work. And um, I will pass it over to Dr. Freiberg. Thank you. Well, I'm going to come at this uh, a little bit different. Um, so I direct um, and recently founded a center at Michigan that is called the RISE Center, Research for Indigenous Social Action and Equity. The goals of this center are really threefold. Um, the first is research-based. We want to conduct research studies that both push forward indigenous voices into the future that allow indigenous people to be central to what that future should look like. What are the needs our communities have? Um, if we live in urban settings, if we live in reservation settings, how do we give voice to that? And the issue here is both about a reclaiming of the past, because in many respects, indigenous people are written out of history. So we are seen as historical people, we are not seen as contemporary people. We have actually, our center has conducted studies that we're working to put out that literally show that 80% of Americans hold a bias that indigenous people are people of the past. Um, often we hear conversations, uh, speeches, stories, writing of history as though indigenous people not only are not here today fighting for our communities, fighting for our future generation, but a retelling of history about racism in America that doesn't include us. So we speak of the history, we talk as though indigenous people weren't and aren't part of that history. So the research piece is both about stopping the invisibility, stopping the erasure of indigenous people, but also providing data in spaces where, especially in policy realms, where we are also left out of financial um, policy decisions that would bring money into indigenous communities to help deal with issues like the high poverty rates, the lack of housing, um, the lack of medical and mental health um, cl clinicians. Like we just don't have enough in our community. But all the way to bringing to our future generations and telling them this is what we need from you. 
So as we look forward in the work that we're doing, we're constantly trying to both mentor, so both here at the University of Michigan, um, you know, we have now a number of PhDs that we know are going to go out and, and continue this legacy of building research, bringing voice to indigenous issues, but we have to mentor them in ways that are culturally resonant. Um, we also are working, we're very much a center that looks outward. So we work with philanthropies, we work with film directors, artists, activists across the country so that we are working in collaboration to take that research out into society and to do work that will ultimately change the story, change the history. And so I'll stop there and pass to my colleague here. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I'll, you know, I, I have found it so interesting to, to hear my colleagues describe um, not only their work, but really their life passion. Um, and as I reflect on um, President Wu's remarks, um, as someone who is a scholar of both leadership and diversity, um, I'm struck by how leadership decisions are in part about an envisioned future. Um, part of the symposium is based on you know, the aim of bringing to light how the past can inform that envisioned future. Um, at the University of Michigan, I am, um, I'm really proud that not only do some centers look outward, but as a university, we have a responsibility to integrate the community around us uh, and think about the needs um, that perhaps have been overlooked. Uh, President Ono, what a bold move that one of your first, uh, uh, I think, actions and decisions as president is to enlist the help of Liz uh, and Earl Lewis as co-chairs of the Inclusive History Project to not brush aside what's been done in the past, but rather to engage in that dialogue that President Wu talked about. Um, as someone who is deeply involved, uh, and I'm at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy with a joint appointment at the Business School, uh, I look at leadership much like you do diversity. Um, it's not an outcome, it's a practice. And as I think about our discussion here today as it applies to the future leaders of tomorrow, one of, I think, our uh, utmost responsibilities is to teach them how to engage in that dialogue, um, understanding sort of elements of how they can self-manage their own identities, disagreements, to come to the dialogue that will lead us to uh, serve a broader set of stakeholders. Thank you for that. Um, so we have uh, your organization of leadership initiative, and you mentioned some complimentary mm -hmm. efforts. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Really interested to hear more about your new organization, and certainly more about the Inclusive History Project. I thought President Wu's framing today was absolutely perfect because one of the things that, as you said, he brought to life is the fact that this is a journey. This is not a math problem with an answer. It's something that we have to be committed to for the, for the long haul. If we think about the Inclusive History Project, what are some key things that you've learned about the University of Michigan's past that will inform how we are prepared to serve Gen Alpha? Well, that's a tricky question because uh, we are in what we've been calling year zero, which means yeah. it's a, a planning year. Um, part of what we've been doing is we've been sort of taking stock of what's already known, what resources exist, um, is learning about how this kind of project is really part of a larger movement that's happening, happening on many different university campuses. So um, just two weeks ago, we had a symposium where we brought leaders here from other campuses who were um, doing similar projects. So for example, we had someone here from the University of Virginia who's been studying the um, importance of slavery to the um, building of the university. And um, one of the things that we heard about and learned about from them is how it, a project like this is very much um, a community-driven project and that it works when you bring in people from every part of the university, when there's kind of a, a shared um, buy-in from the leaders. And um, 
interestingly, part of what moved that uh, program forward at the University of Virginia was um, student protest, which um, mm -hmm. President Wu also talked about as being really an important engine of change on university campuses. Um, that kind of, um, kind of community-led conversation is something that we're also <coughs> learning about how many places on campus um, people are already doing that work. So there's a really exciting um, program that's been going on at the Bentley Historical Library where they've put together a website called the um, African American Student Project that documents the life of every black student at the university up until 1970. It's interactive, there's many stories. If you're interested in this, I would really encourage you to um, check it out. But I think it's a great example of um, how we can take this information that we're learning and make it accessible widely in a way that many people can be drawn into this conversation because I really believe that the power of this is going to be the community discussion that we can have around it as we reflect and kind of reckon uh, about the significance of this history. And that informs our present. So Dr. Freiberg, you shared some thoughts on how you're looking at data collection uh, to inform the work that you're doing with the tribal communities. You wanna share more about that? Sure. I mean, I think it's important to consider, first of all, I mean, I, came, I haven't been at Michigan that long, um, but I came to Michigan in part because of Michigan's storied history, right? So I felt that given what Michigan has done in the past, it, this was a place that we could build a platform for indigenous issues. Now, I, I, I think there's a way in which the university has a troubled history with the indigenous people in Michigan. I don't think we've lived up to the Fort Meigs Treaty. Um, we are not educating the indigenous people in this state. Um, and I doubt, so I, I, and I don't want to be Debbie Downer. I just really <laughs> think we need to be honest yeah. in owning that historically this university has not upheld that treaty. Um, and it is the one thing that the indigenous people, like this land was taken from in, an indigenous community and you know, it's something that we need to rectify. So put, starting there, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I hear you and I think we very much have to start the conversation from that space of where are the seeds? Where is it growing? And so when I think about the work that we're doing at Michigan, there's both a Michigan focus and a I mean, much more of a national focus, but they're related. And yes. so when we look at, we have projects looking at murdered missing indigenous women and girls and violence against indigenous women. We have projects that we just uh, got a paper published in one of the best journals in psychology about civic engagement and what leads to civic engagement for indigenous people. And much of it is, the more you render us invisible, the more our people are saying no, and they're going to stand up. They see it as discrimination. And I think we really have to start taking ownership in that. So in each of the projects that we, we currently have 40 projects, research projects going on at the center. And in those projects, each of them hits, we have education, uh, we have projects that are gender-based, um, and by that, you know, it, it, it's very much trying to push beyond the current boundaries of how we think about identity for indigenous people. We're not a monolith, right? We're a very complex, very fast growing population. Um, but I think in thinking about what is the contribution we can make at Michigan is that we can get better at not allowing in our conversations about DEI, in our fight for equity and justice, in our push to make our, stu our students good citizens who mm -hmm. are contributing to a future that is inclusive, we have to make sure that we as professors and scholars and administrators aren't also rendering indigenous people invisible. Mm -hmm. And so it, it happens literally every day on this campus, it happens all the time across the country. And so I think the work we're doing is trying to stop that invisibility and erasure. Sure. President Wu, any thoughts on Queens College, your experience in this space? Sure. Uh, I want to lift up something that's a theme here that's implicit, that's also part of the Supreme Court case from a generation ago. It's hard to believe that that is a historic decision so far in the past, right? <laughs> and it is that this is all based on evidence. One of the things 
there's backlash right now about everything that we're doing, everything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And some of the people who are part of that say, well, these are just things you're making up. The irony is, no, it's the other way around. They're just making up things. When Michigan prevailed 20 years ago, it was because there was proof, actual admissible evidence by legal standards. And what you are doing is all about facts that have been there, they've just been pushed to the sides, but the margins are, are making a new mainstream. So that's what I would lift up, that this is all about facts. And I want to highlight and celebrate something that you've mentioned rightly that, that I've been remiss about, which is not including Native peoples. Mm -hmm. And fact is so important there too. I formerly led an institution affiliated with the University of California that just changed its name about six months ago. And the historical record is clear. The founder of that institution bragged about how he was, and pardon this language, I think it's important to use it because it was used at the time, he was an Indian killer. He directed and financed what was just clearly genocide um, in order to exercise dominion over lands in Northern California. And th this is just well attested to in part because it was so open that there was no need to hide it. <laughs> so that's what this is about. It's about evidence and facts. So what's the leadership opportunity? You have uh, <laughs> many. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so we are leaders and best. Uh, how do we own up to that as we move forward, given the foundation that's been discussed here? You know, I, I haven't been at the University of Michigan uh, too long either. It's, it's, this is my second year. Um, and the person who recruited me is uh, Michael Barr, who is now at, at the Federal Reserve. I have great respect for him. Um, I was at a business school and had never thought about making the jump to a school of public policy. Um, but Michael and those who know Michael, uh, Michael Barr is a very persuasive man. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think Part of the, um, the appeal was this co-creation of what does it mean to develop the type of leaders who not only care, but are skilled um, in engaging in the dialogue and can take the information, the facts of the past, to develop a more equitable future. Um, I, think that the groundwork at the University of Michigan is incredibly exciting because of our porous boundaries with the community, because of our porous boundaries across schools. The types of issues that we're talking about hit on a number of different disciplines, and one of the, 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 the aspects of the university that I was excited to join, and I've seen sort of the, the vibrancy that, that exists here, is that we are in conversation with each other across those disciplines about these very large challenges. So there's much to build on. Um, I'll give you a small example. I, uh, when I, the collegiate chair is a collegiate chair, you could get to choose the name of the person that you want to honor with your collegiate chair. And you'll see here is Ligia Ramirez de Reynolds is the person that I chose. And she's actually an Ann Arbor native. Um, she's about 98 years old. I had the wonderful pleasure of meeting her. She is the first um, graduate at the University of Michigan, uh, South American woman to have gotten a PhD. Um, I'm originally Brazilian and Honduran. English is actually my fourth language. And I wanted to connect to a past that felt really quite genuine to me. Um, now, she received her PhD in 1970, which seems sort of recent. <laughs> I see, it was. I see <laughs> President Wu's uh, facial expression. Um, so that tells me both you know, that we still have a long way to go, um, but the progress is being made. And the reason I was able to find Ms. Lichia is that our very librarians had gone about the task of uncovering all of our past records to have sort of a concerted, a concerted effort <clears throat> to um, uh, develop a more accurate history of who's been here, mm -hmm. right? So that we can understand who is to come. 
So I don't know if I answered your question completely, um, but I will say there's, there's a great deal of potential in this incredibly vibrant university and in, uh, to, to harness the goodwill of not only our students, but also faculty and staff who very much believe in a brighter future. So let's, as we wrap up, let's kind of person to person answer the question of are we ready? Is the University of Michigan prepared? Who wants to kick that off? Dr. Cole. Well, I believe we've been preparing for this moment um, as long as I've been affiliated with the university, which goes back to the 80s. Um, I, I often hold up those Supreme Court cases as a moment when the university um, took a stand that was uh, risky and bold and principled. And um, I'm, I'm confident we'll continue to act that way. We're ready. <laughs> can, I, can I jump off of just what Liz said? Because we, we are working together on this inclusive history project. And when we had the panel of, um, of colleagues who came and talked to us about their experience going through the very process that we are just beginning. One of the things that struck me, I don't know if it struck you as well, is that uh, they came and, and each of them talked about the resistance within their universities that they felt. That you know, their encouragement to us as a committee was to keep fighting the good fight and, um, and stay the course. And you know, looking around the room and, and having it, you know, begun um, these conversations across our three campuses, I haven't felt that sort of resistance that they've talked about. I haven't felt the obstacles being put in our way. In fact, I, I have felt you know, encouragement to continue and openness about what is currently being done and how can we leverage what is already in action so that we can move forward. So to me, to answer your question and building on what, what Liz's efforts, um, you know, how she discussed those efforts, I think that um, you know, the, the wind is at our back. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Dr. Freiberg. So, okay, I'm a native person. I'm gonna tell a little story. Um, and, and, I, and I say that in the sense that storytelling has, has always been a big part of mm -hmm. um, both how we educate our children, but also it's, it's a big part of how I teach. So I went to Stanford, and um, it turns out three out of four of my faculty um, dissertation committee were Michigan alums. And um, <laughs> one of the faculty at the University uh, at Stanford um, was he led our social brown bag my entire graduate career. And he started every social brown bag at Stanford by linking the speaker back to the University of Michigan. <laughs> so I know a lot about the University of Michigan. Um, and, and I'm not going to say I, I had any bad feelings about this. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely had a lot of head nodding moments about it. But through that time, I had the opportunity to meet a number of, of Michigan alumni. And one person um, who was provost here in the 90s, Nancy Kanner, um, I had the opportunity to meet many times. And what always struck me about Nancy is that she was willing to stand up when others sat down. And then I had the privilege, um, my academic grandmother is Pat Gurin. And Pat Gurin has a storied history here at the University of Michigan. Um, and much of the research that you talked about is from Pat Gurin. And Pat Gurin had the courage to stand up when others sat down. And so what I think about, are we ready? If history is the best indicator of the future, it's that we will continue to stand up when others sit down. So I think we are ready. It's not just that some will sit down. We, we all know something big and bad is coming our yes, way. And some are going to turn and run. So the question is, and every, everyone who heads an institution of higher education is thinking about this, what next? And I'm confident University of Michigan is not only ready, but will lead again. We're going to end on that inspirational note. We are truly leaders and best. I think everyone here sees that through your leadership. Thank you for all that you are doing. And thank you for having us. Thank you.
I believe we are on break for about 15 minutes.
microphone is interesting. Good morning, <clears throat> and welcome to the second segment of today's symposium, Working Together to Tackle the Climate Crisis. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, my former boss, Janet Napolitano, to our second symposium this morning. Napolitano is a lifelong public servant. She's the former president of the University of California, Secretary of Homeland Security, and Governor of Arizona. As Secretary of Homeland Security, Napolitano led federal efforts to ensure citizen safety, from countering terrorism to securing and managing the borders. Napolitano responded to natural disasters and worked to secure cyberspace and critical infrastructure from the oil leak in the Gulf of Mexico to Hurricane Sandy. She also created DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, one of the most important actions that a Secretary of Homeland Security could take to allow tens of thousands of children who know no other country but ours to remain in America. As University of California president, Napolitano not only advocated for students by stabilizing in-state tuition and recruiting first-generation students, but she put the university on a path to, to achieve 100% reliance on clean electricity by 2025. When she ran for re-election as governor of Arizona, she was the first candidate in Arizona history to win every county in legislative district. And on a personal note, an inspiration to me was a story that she told me one day as I told her about my imminent departure from DHS. She asked me what I was going to do next, and I told her that I was interested in running for office someday. She then told me about her first time running for office herself. Her opponent in that race was wealthy and was able to partially self-fund through a trust fund. Now, Secretary Napolitano did not come from wealth, but she told me that she called her father a professor at the University of New Mexico and asked him where her trust fund was so she could have money to run for office. He paused and then said he would mail her a check for $20 as the entirety of the Napolitano Trust. <laughs> but all jokes aside, through running for office, she showed that there was a place in public life at the highest echelons for those who did not come from wealth and the daughter of a college professor in New Mexico could rise to run the state of Arizona and eventually join Barack Obama's cabinet. And I stand up here today proud that I was able to serve on her team in Washington. Napolitano earned her undergraduate degree in political science from Santa Clara University. A Truman Scholar, she was the university's first female valedictorian. She received her law degree from the University of Virginia and subsequently was awarded the Jefferson Medal, its highest honor. It is my great honor to welcome Janet Napolitano. Actually, he sent me $5. So good afternoon. My name is Janet Napolitano, and I bring greetings from our nation's premier public research university system, the University of California, <laughs> to one of its great public research universities, the University of Michigan. Go Blue! <laughs> I'm especially pleased to be here to congratulate my good friend, Santa Ono, on assuming the presidency of this great institution. I met Santa when he was president of the University of British Columbia, and I was serving as president of the University of California, and as president of UC3, the University Climate Change Coalition. UC3 was born of the belief that universities particularly research universities, can and should play an important role in understanding anthropomorphic climate change and developing methods both for mitigation of and adaptation to the warming of our planet. And I was pleased to see in the posters outside um, this morning 
some of the projects underway at this university. Everything from the Inglewood oil field uh, restoration and redevelopment project, uh, cleaning up oil fields in Louisiana, to the kick-starting uh, circular and arbor project, um, indicating the connection with the community in which University of Michigan is located. Now, in addition to working within the university community, UC3 was also conceived to link the academy to the communities in which they are located. When I handed the gavel of UC3 to President Ono, its membership included 18 university systems, including the State University of New York, Arizona State, and Caltech, to name but three. Its membership now includes 23 institutions, from the University of British Columbia to Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Now, in its fifth year, UC3 has developed and refined its role as an accelerant of place-based climate solutions and a leading voice on the urgency of emissions mitigation and climate resilience actions. Now, the University of California was one of UC3's founders so I'd like to take a few moments to describe what's been happening at UC, as well as some lessons learned along the way. One initial lesson is that vocabulary and word choice matter. When I took over as the president of the University of California in 2013, I stated that the system would be carbon neutral by the year 2025. Now this was admittedly an audacious goal for a system that encompasses 10 campuses, six medical schools, a network of academic teaching hospitals, and a statewide natural preserve system. But carbon neutrality, it was a bumper sticker. It was easy to say. It was broad enough to permit the organization of multiple research projects, administrative initiatives, and curricular additions, all under the umbrella rubric of carbon neutrality. And any number of other universities, corporations, and communities have now adopted carbon neutrality as their stated goal. As we've now discovered, however, Achieving true carbon neutrality is virtually impossible without purchasing carbon offsets. And carbon offsets themselves are nearly impossible to measure. The market for carbon offsets enables greenwashing activities that do not by themselves further the goal of reducing the amount of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So we need to be real about this. So to take the place of carbon neutrality, current UC President Michael Drake has now formed a task force focused on pathways to a fossil-free UC, thereby removing the temptation to carbon credit our way out of the carbon neutrality conundrum. Each campus has now been given $12 million to adopt methods to decarbonize, and each campus has been given a specific direction to reduce on-campus use of natural gas by 90%. This is the kind of specific hard work it will take to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. The state of California is helping. Last year, for example, the state of California allocated $185 million for California higher education institutions to undertake research and innovation related to climate change. Of that total, $85 million went specifically to three UCs, 
you see Riverside, you see Rivers, you see Santa Cruz, and you see Merced. Another 20 million will go to innovation and entrepreneurship activities for new climate-related technologies. And the University of California will administer the remaining $80 million to be awarded competitively to California institutions that apply. So, in other words, the university took action with specificity and the state now has come behind the university to support that financially. And to go along with those efforts, University of California faculty have been developing courses that run the gamut of the issues that arise concerning climate change. A particularly exciting one is called Bending the Curve and was conceived by a consortium of faculty led by Ram Ramanathan at UC San Diego. Bending the Curve is now offered throughout the University of California system. And it looks at three areas, climate risk and adaptation, climate justice, and climate solutions. Educating the next diverse generation of climate scientists and policymakers is the type of work that great universities ought to do. And the creation of UC3 student fellowships under the leadership of President Ono is another example. Now I mentioned the lesson learned about use of the phrase carbon neutrality. A second lesson learned involved the healthcare side of the University of California. Great univer research universities have great medical schools and great teaching hospitals. Many, if not most, of UC3's members, including Michigan, fall within this category. But hospitals and medical laboratories are tremendous energy users and emitters. I must admit, there was some initial reticence, if not downright resistance, from our healthcare faculty and staff to joining in the university's climate initiatives. And for those of you here who have run universities, you understand what kind of power the healthcare faculty can bring. <laughs> but I am pleased to report that this has changed and dramatically so. UC now has a system-wide center on climate, health, and equity. Exciting research is underway on how to create climate-ready healthcare institutions, and courses on health and equity are now integrated into the healthcare curricula. What changed? I can't pinpoint a single causal factor, but I think a few things came to bear. First, there was a growing recognition of the hospital's energy usage that was coupled with the greater availability and lower costs of fossil-free energy sources. In other words, the energy mix was changing, and thus economics played an important role. Second, the effects of climate especially on changing weather patterns and weather extremes on public health was of increasing and visible importance. And finally, students themselves more by way, uh, demanded more by way of treating patients in accord with the environment in which their patients lived. Nonetheless, the extension of climate to the healthcare side of research universities exemplifies how UC3 can grow and expand. And as we all appreciate, climate change has multiple cascading effects. So I was pleased again to see this morning in walking around the poster exhibit some of the efforts underway in at Michigan on the healthcare side. 
white coats for planetary health, uh, courses on incorporating environmental health into medical training. Um, this is all part of involving the whole research university, all of its parts, into the battle on climate change. And it is a battle. Changes in weather patterns and extreme weather events, food security, water security, vectors for infectious disease, migration patterns, and geopolitical struggles over scarce natural resources all can be traced to the warming of the planet since the Industrial Revolution. The problems are urgent and existential. Greenhouse gas emissions are now more than 50% higher than they were in 1990. The climate change is a classic frog in boiling water problem. That is the problem, you know, the frog's in a pot of water and it's warming so gradually that the frog doesn't notice until the water is boiling. These types of frog problems are difficult for policymakers to deal with in a world of competing crises and where the required societal changes are so fundamental. The list is endless. Economic, energy, food systems, health, housing, natural resource management, transportation, waste, all require mitigation and adaptation if we are to continue to thrive. But frog problems are the types of problems that research universities are ideally designed for. Take the list I just gave and I guarantee you that there are UC experts and students working right now on exciting new ways to counteract the effects of a warming planet. And I will bet you dollars to donuts, the same is true here at Michigan. Uh, for, through work underway at um, institutes such as the Graham Sustainability Institute. However, and now I'm speaking as a former elected official. Universities don't run on two or four year election cycles. They run on the excitement of creating new knowledge. They exist on the energy of their students who bring their own sense of urgency to campus. But again, they're not on the two or four year cycle. And that makes a difference where policymaking is concerned. So a bridge must, must be created between the research university and the needs of their communities to create solutions to the problems they confront. Solutions that ideally are practical and scalable. UC3 is designed to be a bridge between its member universities and their surrounding communities. For illustration, it is impossible to think of Ann Arbor or indeed the state of Michigan without the existence of the University of Michigan or the Bay Area without Berkeley or Los Angeles without UCLA. The challenge is building that bridge and how we communicate from the academy to the political leadership that is required ultimately is fundamental if we are to achieve anything significant where climate change is concerned. But Michigan's in a great place. To be a great university, it requires great leadership. And that is where President Ono comes in. He is well equipped to lead the university into a great future over the coming years and he's well equipped to talk to legislators, mayors, the governor, um, because that is an essential part of building the bridge, understanding the problems they see, the constraints they're working under, 
and then offering the strength of the university to help them solve those problems. Um, and that's why uh, great states are great when they have great public research universities. It's an essential tool. We all need to redouble our efforts and our commitment where climate is concerned. Um, how many lectures have you gone to about climate recently? Raise your hand. How many of them have been cheerful? <laughs> right. Look, we got a lot of smart people. We have to have that sense of common unity of effort, unity of purpose, common uh, values, uh, common understanding that it is just not right to leave the climate crisis for another generation or another generation after that. We can already see the consequences of having left it go this far. The water is getting warmer by the day. We must not allow the frog to boil. Thank you very much. So good morning, or is it afternoon? Uh, all I know is the clock is ticking, and it's ticking faster every day. Uh, the climate crisis is probably the greatest ex existential threat we face today. And each of the panelists who will be joining me today are deeply involved in finding and implementing just solutions to this crisis. However, we need to be honest Real solutions will not be easy, and as I said, the clock is ticking faster and faster. We know that time is running short. With each passing day that we delay in making the necessary policy changes needed to mitigate and adapt and build resilient communities and a carbon neutral economy, the challenge will only get bigger and the consequences greater. In no one sector, public, private, higher education, or community groups can solve this on their own. We need to build strong, diverse, public, private, community partnerships that operate on all levels, locally, regionally, state and federally, and even globally if we're going to fix this for future generations. This is especially true in a time of great divide, divided politically, socially, geographically, and geopolitically. Just the type of complex, large societal issues that research universities should lead on. So let's welcome our panelists to the stage, and I'll introduce each one of them briefly. Um, first, let me introduce Omar Lade Adunbi. He is a professor of Afro-American and African Studies and the Honors Program and the director of the African Studies Center in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Andy Hoffman, professor of Management and Organizations, professor of Environment and Sustainability. He is the Holcomb Professor of Sustainable Enterprise at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business in the School for Environment and Sustainability. Margaret Woolbridge, the author, Thornow Professor of Mechanical Engineering. The Walter J. Hubbard Jr. Professor of Sustainable Energy and Environment and Earth Systems Engineering at our College of Engineering. And of course, our esteemed guest, President, Secretary, <laughs> Governor, Janet Napolitano. Welcome. So I have questions for each of you. Uh, 
But I'm going to start with Janet first. Fire away. And I am very informal, so you're all going by your first name, no matter what. But uh, Janet, I mean, you've had this you know, really ex you know, distinguished career. You, you've sat on many different ledges to see this issue from many different angles. So I'm going to just ask you from your perspective, what are the biggest opportunities and hurdles to making the necessarily dramatic progress in order to address the climate crisis? I think um, opportunities exist through uh, the advancement of uh, different technologies, methodologies being developed every day that make um, both the mix of energy we use different the efficiency of how we use energy uh, uh, different, um, and indeed um, new technologies that decarbonize um, uh, the atmosphere. Challenges. Uh, first of all, um, uh, climate is international. Uh, so all the community, the community of nations has to work together, not something we do very well. Um, and the effects uh, of climate vary greatly, um, uh, particularly between uh, the big emitters uh, 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 and the wealthy emitters, like the United States, and uh, poorer countries, like the country, most of the countries in Africa, um, South America. Um, and, and so there needs to be, and there, those discussions have already occurred somewhat, and some money has been identified, not a lot, um, uh, to try to um, equalize the playing field, as it were. But I think we have to recognize it's a global existential issue. The United States has a, uh, a lot of responsibility here. Uh, China is a big emitter now. They have a lot of responsibility. Um, the countries of uh, Western Europe, um, uh, the so-called wealthier countries. Um, and it's really hard to persuade taxpayers that some of their money ought to go to uh, uh, Ghana. Um, to uh, help deal with climate change or the, or the Pacific Island nations and the like. So the international aspect of it, the inequality aspect of it, and um, the uh, equity aspect of it is very challenging. Thank you. So this is for, 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 for any or all of you, uh, but how can the likes of government higher education, the private sector, nonprofits and community forces build the coalitions needed to make real progress fast enough to head off the worst of the climate crisis. Don't be shy. <laughs> Andy. Oh, I just got cold called. I, I would begin by recognizing the full scope and scale of this issue. Uh, when I think of climate change, I don't think of an environmental issue. I think of a systems breakdown. With a systems breakdown, you have to fix the system. That's how, how big we have to think. Uh, I would also point out climate change is just one marker of this broader systems breakdown. Uh, we have, our species have grown to such numbers and our technology is such power that we can alter global systems. So we can talk about climate change. We can also talk about biodiversity loss, land system use, ocean acidification, all the markers of what's called the Anthropocene. And so with that in mind, we have to go down to fundamental questions about how our systems are structured, um, what kind of solutions we have. Technology is great. Technology isn't the only answer. An electric car is great, but that is not the answer. The answer is rethinking mobility. And so we have to get to that level of question to capture the reality that all the constituents you named have to be part of the solution. So here on the campus, we have to break down the silos between schools and bring all the components together to look at the technological, the economic, the cultural, the equity, all the things that uh, Janet talked about, we have to bring to bear. 
Yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, we have to begin to think about uh, uh, what I'll call global inclusivity. That is, uh, by solutions to the climate crisis, it's not just uh, something that is limited to the United States and the uh, countries of the global north, but we also have to begin to think about uh, countries of the global south who are most impacted by the climate crisis. So, for example, uh, many of the conflict that we see in many African countries today are climate related, although sometimes some of those conflicts are uh, either tagged as ethnic or religious conflict. But beneath this is the fact that uh, many of them are climate related. Oceans are drying, lakes that provide livelihood to many of these communities are drying up, farmers are in conflict with others. And that by a lot of farmers are not able to produce up enough food for the population. So there is food insecurity. There is a, uh, uh, you know, general ins human insecurity too. So then if we're going to think about a solution to all of these, how do we engineer a new form of technology that is inclusive, that also brings a lot of these disenchant disenchanted and disenfranchised communities into the table to be part of the solution to the crisis. And I see the University of Michigan playing a leading role. We are leaders and the best, so we see Michigan playing a leading role in this. And I'll cite one example, which is what we've been doing in a couple of years now. Uh, thanks to the Office of the President, we have the African Presidential Scholars Program which brings a lot of scholars from the continent of Africa to Michigan, hosted by our faculty here from engineering to medicine, you know, to the social sciences. And many of these scholars work on issues of climate change. So then how do we harness this opportunity to make sure that there is collaborative research in developing technologies of the future, technologies that bring everyone to the table to solve the climate crisis? Want me to chime in or wait? Well, I can, yeah, I'll tell <laughs> I'll you. Chime so in. I got a question for you. Okay. Uh, so we'll go that way, but just for, for everybody, always feel free to answer the question you wish I had asked you. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but Margaret, uh, how can we focus university research to produce the most effective research to find needed scientific and public policy solutions? How can we help them to focus on research that can actually be utilized uh, by government and communities to make dramatic impact on addressing uh, climate change. Cool. So I'm going to answer that question, maybe part of comment on uh, the previous question as well. I want to offer some optimism in, so that in response to Janet's comment about, oh, these are always so depressing, they are and they aren't. So a really good friend um, and colleague here, Ricky Rood, who works in climate and space sciences, would always come to my classes every year. I'd ask him to come and give a presentation on climate change from an energy and thermodynamics perspective. And the first time he came, I, I left him like, oh, Ricky, you practically made me cry. That was so depressing. <laughs> uh, and Ricky turned to me and he's like, but it is and it isn't because we live in unprecedented times, unprecedented levels of communication, and we have unprecedented tools at our disposal whether they're technological tools, whether they're social political tools, but we really are informed in ways we've never been before. So this is great. And the key here, so that's one side of the uh, equation, if you will. The other side is we have an appetite to make equitable solutions. Mm -hmm. So as we've heard, the students want to work in this space. The faculty want to work in this space. The staff want to work in this space. So we have tools and appetite, and that's great. So when you say, how can we make research, how can we enable research specifically at universities, we're already doing what I think is the most critical thing, which is we're changing the value system. So, and that's hard, because we know universities are, you know, glacial. Well, maybe glaciers aren't the best example. Of <laughs> so maybe I need something else. <laughs> so maybe it's core the, temperature. The, gla the glaciers are melting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, um, the value system, because now we're seeing so importantly, like, I'm an engineer, so technology is important, but I totally agree with Andy. It's a system issue, and I'm not going to technology us out of this. 
So I don't have a magic you know, technology that's gonna fix this. It's a systems question. And that requires policy, cultural change, behavioral change, and we're seeing that. We understand that this is more than just electric cars. It's a lot more than that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I get excited by this. So there is this opportunity to change the way we value engagement. Specifically, we have engineers that now it's like, okay, don't just look at the electric vehicle, look at the sourcing of the lithium that will travel 50,000 miles before it ends up in your battery. Look at what happens to that battery at end of life. Oh, we'll take it out of the car, we'll put it on the grid. Dex and death and taxes happens to all of us and batteries. So there will be a point where they're not on the grid anymore. So you have to have an exit strategy for all of these resources. So I think Janice mentioned waste. I would argue that's both our, one of our biggest Achilles heels. It's also one of our biggest opportunities because we're trying to move off of fossil fuels. Oh, what are biofuels? Well, biofuels are young carbon. So let's take these, you know, you've heard, I'm sure many of the people in this audience have heard about the circular economy. Let's make it happen. That's really important is that we take these resources and these systems and we think about what does end of life look like? And it probably shouldn't be end of life. The resources should be captured again. That's economically uphill right now, but there's an appetite for it. How many people in the audience bought organic fruits and vegetables, right? If you, maybe a few of you, you're paying a premium for that because those systems don't yield as much, right? In terms of crop yield. But we are showing this appetite for, <laughs> pun intended, we have an appetite for organic foods. Why not an appetite for, we, many of us buy repurposed and recycled materials. You look for the label that says this was repurposed, this was upcycled. So how do we change the value structure to engage researchers and build trust in communities to understand the full cycle and not just the immediate need? There is an immediate need, but we need to think about the exit strategies. And we need to set in place at the university the structure that allows people to carefully think and reflect on all of that. And we are changing it. So it's not just, I wrote a paper this year, I wrote a book, I got a grant. It's, I built trust in the community that I'm engaging with so that I understand what their needs are and the technology can be appropriate or the policy or the system. So, and, and, and to add to that, in, in terms of building trust, one of the things that needs to happen is to build trust with local elected officials, absolutely. state elected, mm -hmm. federal. Um, uh, you know, if we're saying climate change is the existential crisis of our generation, it needs to be front and center in every political campaign, yeah. and we ought to be encouraging candidates, give us your climate plan. What do you see as the challenges and the opportunities? What are you willing to invest in in order to, to move the needle? Yes, absolutely. But I want to pick up and, and go further. You use the word engagement, and that's really important. Right now, we as academics, we're rewarded for our A-level publications, our citation count, our H index, and we look inward. And so how do we incent academics to bring their work out into the world where it's needed? Uh, that's, a, that's a serious cultural challenge for the academic system writ large. I had used that sort of framework, but for another sector. And so Andy, I'm just, you know, wiser folks than, than I have said that if we're going to really solve the climate uh, crisis, then business has to lead. Uh, how do we pull the necessary public policy levers to get narrowly focused you know, private interest, to collaborate and engage positively, to deploy their capital and their often uh, extensive capabilities to help solve this crisis? To my mind, this is one of the most important questions in the sense that the market in many ways causes problems. We are a consumptive society. We like to consume goods. We like to consume energy. Uh, but the market has to solve it. 
there are people out there, Naomi Klein says, we have to shred capitalism, come up with a new system. I don't think that's feasible. Every set of institutions come from the institutions that precede it. So the question is, how do we move the market to address this problem? It's a, it's a very powerful set of institutions that mobilize action. I mean, the stock answer is a carbon price, but that, to my mind, totally underplays the kind of change that's necessary. To my mind, we are at an interesting institutional shifting point where the dominant model, the shareholder neoliberal capitalist model, has shown itself to be flawed. And one marker is climate change or the Anthropocene. The other marker is the panel that preceded this, inequality. Mm -hmm. We have inequality in this country that you haven't mm -hmm. seen since the Great Depression. That is built into the system. Thomas Piketty wrote a whole book about this. And so how do we bring us to the next system? We've only had shareholder capitalism since 1970. Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher. Now it's, 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 it's breaking under its own weight. How do we think about the next system? Re-examine the purpose of the corporation. Re-elevate the role of government in the market. Rethink the role of business in its lobbying and its political activities. Rethink consumption. These are all questions that need to be asked. We've started to think about a new economic system that comes from the old, but is turned towards addressing the great challenges of our day, like climate change. Cool. Okay. Like Omar Lade, you're, I got a question for you. Okay. <laughs> but we know, you know, we know that the impact of climate change will be and is felt differently across different uh, economic and social communities. Some of the worst impacts will be felt in the least resourced places. How can we provide a just response to the climate crisis, ensuring that communities experiencing the harshest impacts receive the resources needed, as well as making sure that their voices and perspective are part of the solutions that are deployed in their communities? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just to uh, add a little bit to what Andy said about uh, uh, the market being uh, self-corrective, uh, if we are going to say that, well, there has to be a time when the market will self-correct, then how do we bring people that are left out of this market into the market space? And uh, in many of the communities where I work, for example, they are out of the market space, and that is because they are resource enclaves and their resources, fossil fuel, lithium, and other resources are being extracted by those who are the market players on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, they are not just uh, participating in the marketplace, they are not just left out of, of the marketplace, but they are also losing their livelihood practices. So the suffer is double jeopardy on a daily basis. So the question becomes, how do we create an inclusive system in this market space that is going to emerge that includes all of these people? And uh, uh, that is what I see as uh, a workable solution. And that is where I see the role of uh, the university as being important here as uh, uh, a site that generates ideas, generate new knowledge, new form of knowledge that can change systems. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, I think um, I agree. Uh, I, I, th I think we need, however, to look at the university as, as, a, as a one player of many um, that will need to be involved, energized, so to speak, um, uh, and committed uh, to uh, really reaching, for example, the uh, climate goal set in the Paris Accord. Um, uh, it seems to me unlikely that we will reach it in the time given, but we, sh we should commit ourselves to, if we're not gonna reach it, get as close as we can um, uh, in order to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Um, and that requires universities, but it requires private industry, it requires governments operating at a macro and micro level. 
And, and if I can add to that, and, and it comes from your remarks, universities need to walk the talk. When I talk to corporations and, and they get their back up saying, your scientists are telling us we have to reduce our carbon, but you're not reducing your own, it totally weakens our voice. So right. that we, have to, we have to be at the table. Right, I think uh, lead by example. Okay. Um, and students, the students I talk they're totally into it. Um, uh, and they want to be uh, um, uh, players too, and we ought to use that. Did you see the University of Cambridge? The students just voted to make all their dining commons vegan. The students are ahead of us. Yeah, we absolutely. need to catch up to them. I don't know about the vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let me chime in too, is that the universities, this is not something that you would usually put these words in the same sentence. Universities can take risks in ways that small businesses can't. That's and, right. And so yeah. we're here for that. And the students want to do that. They want to say, hey, I'm going to try this new mode of operation, this new business, this new. And like many people, I'm like, I think the answer is small. I, you know, yes, there's a lot to be done with larger corporations and their sustainability development goals. And those are absolutely imperative. But if we have, if this gets ahead of to um, off topic, but we have a dispersed population. And that dispersed population needs to be engaged. Mm. And that can't, isn't going to be done through mega corporations. It's going to be done through the rural communities, these smaller enclaves are going to be engaged through smaller. So we always think, think bigger, economies of scale, think bigger. I'm like, I think we need to get small to work well. And to get small to work well is hard. Small companies, small businesses, et cetera. It's again, economically uphill. But universities can, can help take that risk. We can help de-risk it, whereas a small community isn't going to necessarily think of that as an idea or have the resources to actually play in that space. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, and I think it's, you know, every commentator mentions it, this growing and persistent, you know, divide that's, that, that we're seeing, whether it's in our state, in our nation, uh, globally. You know, and it's really around issues like climate change. And so my question is, how do we find a common language and a common framework to bridge this divide? I think you mentioned you know, rural communities uh, as well. And then can universities you know, play a leadership role to bring these diverse you know, voices together to provide an informed, evidence-based, practical solution in time to address this crisis? This is anybody? Well, I think there are, are uh, uh, kind of uh, pivoting off your idea of looking at the, at the small level, uh, universities can uh, set up and run projects mm -hmm. that solve concrete, uh, illustrative problems. Um, uh, you know, they can kind of go for, like, like, like the project I mentioned outside uh, 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 about uh, cleaning up the oil field in the leftover oil uh, production infrastructure in Louisiana. Um, if we're going to transfer off of fossil fuels and oil and stuff, there's got to be a lot of that infrastructure around, a lot of cleanup projects, et cetera. So a university say, we're going to take this on. We're going to figure out how to do this economically, efficiently, and timely. Uh, and, and then it becomes a demonstration that can then be replicated. Exactly. So I think that's one of the, you know, um, I'm just spitballing here, but that's just one yeah. idea that comes out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So just to add to that, I think uh, I see an opportunity here. Uh, we are all talking about energy transition now. And when we think about energy transition, we think about, uh, uh, for example, electricity. Uh, many countries of the global south, if I use the example of sub-Saharan Africa that I'm uh, familiar with, over 60% of the population are off the grid. So now a lot of the political leaders are thinking about how do we bring people onto the grid. So one of the areas in which they are thinking about is coal mining. And you think about 21st century, someone is talking about coal mining. And this is where I see an opportunity that, look, we can develop new technologies that can help these communities 
get onto the grid without going back into this old technology that is going to aggravate the climate crisis that we are in. So whether it is through uh, by wind energy, for example, or by solar energy, or other forms of energy that is very clean. And the university can play an important role here. There are a lot of scientists in the Global South who are working on these issues. How do we get our scientists, social scientists, and people in, hum in the humanities to collaborate in research projects with all of these scholars in the Global South to provide workable solutions that can bring people onto the grid without going back to those archaic technologies that can aggravate the climate crisis. I think the, at the root of your question is the question of how do we, how do we play a role in, in, in civic dialogue in a period of such division? And um, there was a report by the RAND Corporation a couple of years ago called Truth Decay, which by itself is interesting because it's basically a Defense Department think tank looking at the quality of public discourse in this country, and they had four conclusions. We're debating facts, we're blurring opinion in fact, we distrust previously trusted source of information, aka us, mm -hmm. and we've never seen this before at this level, and social media is a big driver of it. That, to my mind, lays the gauntlet at the door of the academy, and we can't ignore it. Knowledge is our stock and trade. And so if we don't play a role in bridging those divides, bridging the divides that you talked about, we've lost our place in society. And so how do we do that? How can we play the role of convener to bring people together? We don't have to have the magic bullet, the, the special dictionary that allows us to speak in multiple tongues to everybody, but we can be a convener to bring multiple voices to campus. And, and let's face it, we do lean left. Even the UC system leans left. How do we bring more voices from the right onto campus and have the kind of discourse that the previous panel talked about of saying, we're not gonna debate. We're gonna find a common problem and figure out how to solve it because we do have a common problem here. And I, I think that's, that's the way to think about this, the challenge that you're laying out. Let me jump in on that and I'm gonna go even further. So really uh, a good friend of mine first person who hired me in academic, uh, Bud Peterson, previous president of Georgia Tech, said, your most important resource is time. And so when we invite, I absolutely agree with what Andy said, what Lottie said is that we need to bring people to the table and we need to empower them. They have to be able to influence the outcome. We have to value their time, right? So we have to understand that if they come and participate, we will pay them we will give them something to participate because we are asking something very valuable of them, which is to contribute their time and their expertise. And we will give them the power to influence the outcome of what we're trying to do. And I think those two things have not really happened historically. And then I also want to say, um, kind of touching on but what I just mentioned is um, I want you to think about, like we think about energy carriers and we think about electric cars and wind turbines and, and uh, solar photovoltaic farms and things like that. I want to say to you, what if I came to you and said, you can't use your natural gas oven and stove anymore. And if those of, those of you are foodies or cookie, cooking people, you might be like, hey, my, uh, my oven, this is, this is. Keep your hands off. Keep my <laughs> oven, keep my hands off this. This is fundamental. Cook stoves are killing people all over the world because cook stoves are being used in homes and they have terrible emissions associated with them. We have many student teams. Every university has student teams. I guarantee you I can find student teams at every university in the United States that is trying to solve the problem of cook stoves. But you have to go to somebody's home and their culture and say to them, I want you to change this most intimate thing, which is the way you make food. And that is huge. And if you do not have social scientists and policy and engineers and you name it, you are not going to solve that problem. Because you're going to come in with your technology and going to drop in something and, th and those people are going to be like, I can't cook tamales on that. And that takes 20 minutes for me to boil water, which is unacceptable to me. So again, this is an interdisciplinary issue 
And we are a university that has disciplines, many, many disciplines that can come together and work together. So the university needs to enable those interdisciplinary um, projects and opportunities, and we need to engage stakeholders, and we need to, we need to value everyone's time. Yeah, so really good point. Well, uh, what I would add to that is the natural gas stove. Yeah. Um, it's like leading with your chin. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that was mentioned somewhere by somebody, and then all of a sudden the politics went nuts, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think where the university's role is, first of all, we've got to figure out what another better technology is for preparing food. I think having a cook. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, um, uh, but then, as you say, being cognizant of the uh, socio-political environment that, and culture that we are dealing with when you get to that level. We got just a couple sec a couple minutes left, and I just want to get sort of the last question. We'll have to be kind of quick on it, but the clock is ticking, and our students and young people across the globe are demanding that we move faster and make greater headway. They want and desire a seat at the table. What can we say to them to keep their hopes alive while also addressing their fears about our past inactions? Hope. Hope. <laughs> That's a hard word. I mean, they are there. Um, Gen Z is a very interesting generation. They voted in numbers this, this time that young people haven't voted before, which is very exciting. The, the amount of activism on campus I find very exciting. In my, all my years of teaching, I've found campuses kind of politically quiet, and they've lit up over the last few years, uh, particularly around equity and around climate change. And that we need to foster that. We need to support that. We need to bring the whole student into the education process. Right now, we've become, to my mind, a little more transactional than we should be. It's around getting a job and making money. But I'm finding my students, even in the business school, resonating with the idea of a calling or a vocation, a purpose in life. And yet, in many ways, I think that higher education is missing that part of the individual, and we're just trying to teach them practical skills to build their resume to get a job. And so, in many ways, we just have to get out of our own way and allow them to bring them whole selves to the education process and move forward. And, and that can build hope. We don't have the answers, but we can create an environment where they can work with us to find them. Yeah. Anybody else? One thing uh, um, we can do with, uh, with, with students is um, f uh, foster um, their activities in this area. Um, uh, for example, uh, the UC system has a system-wide uh, uh, competition amongst all the dorms across all the campuses uh, on energy efficient usage. Um, and you start with your baseline and then you've got to take it down. Um, and it turns out we've, we've not only developed a lot of new techniques for reducing energy usage um, and, and save money in the meantime, uh, the students can compete for monetary prizes. They like that. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it gets a, a sense of greater community participation amongst uh, the university. I agree, an outlet. They need an outlet for their an outlet and an opportunity for the, for the students that are minded in this way to give them the opportunity to just exercise those creative juices, just give them a chance. And I think that's very important is that they're looking for opportunities. And there are many, many, many on campus. And so I, I think that we, we actually, I think we do that quite well. Um, some students may <laughs> disagree. But I think most, most say that they do, you know, they have, we have so many programs and scholars and co-curricular activities and curricular activities that I, I like to think that everybody has an opportunity. No doubt there can be more, but I just think they need to have the opportunity to really pursue the things that they want to do. Like, like Andy said, get out of their way and let them go. Well, 
everyone, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for being here. I think we've had you know, a really great discussion. The panels have been great. And we really look forward to the other activities as we build towards the inauguration uh, later this afternoon. So thank you very much, and thank you all for listening. That was super fun. Oh, oh, pleasure. That was a pleasure.